And at the end, if you have anything that you'd personally like to ask the authors, um, just let me know and we can have you speak to them. The authors will also be prompting questions throughout the webinar, so please respond in the chat box when the questions are asked if you have anything you'd like to contribute to that. For these questions, please select the drop down all participants so that everyone is able to see your comments. And just so that you're all aware, we also have our psychology community website from Macmillan Learning. I'll be recording and posting this webinar and the author's PowerPoint presentation, so you will have access after the webinar to that. And with that being said, let us present our panelists. Deborah Licht is a professor of psychology in the Department of Psychology at Pikes Peak Community College in Colorado Springs, Colorado. She has had over two decades of teaching and research experience in a variety of settings and has taught introductory psychology, psychology of the workplace, abnormal psychology, the history of psychology, child development, and elementary statistics. Deborah received her Bachelor of Science in Psychology from Wright State University, a master's degree in clinical psychology from the University of Dayton, and a PhD in psychology from Harvard University in 2001. She's greatly inspired by first-generation college students who turn to community colleges to pursue their education and continue to be interested in research on, ca on causal beliefs and their influence on behavior, particularly in relation to how college students think about their successes and failures as they pursue their degrees. Misty Hall is a professor in the Department of Psychology at Pikes Peak Community College in Colorado Springs as well. She has taught a range of psychology courses at Pikes Peak, including introductory psychology, human sexuality, and social psychology. Misty received her Bachelor of Science from Texas Tech University and her Master's in Professional Counseling at Colorado Christian University. From 2002 to 2010, Misty served as the Psychology Discipline Chair for the Colorado Community College System, helping develop the state system's approach to teaching psychology. One of her many professional interests is investigating the impact of student persistence in higher education. Today's webinar is commercially sponsored by Worth Publishers. Deb and Misty are authors of Scientific American Psychology and Scientific American Presenting Psychology, publications of Worth Publishers. There are no known conflicts of interest other than this commercial sponsorship. So with that, I'm going to make them the, pres the presenters and allow the authors to share their screen. Please feel free to chat me any questions that you have throughout the presentation. I'm going to mute myself and let you two take it away. Thank you, Morgan. We appreciate that introduction. This is Deb, by the way, and Misty and I are actually sharing a computer, so um, you, you, you get to know my voice first, and Misty, you want to introduce yourself so yes. they can hear. Hi, everybody. Thanks for your patience and getting started today. We're really excited to be presenting this workshop in a WebEx format, and, uh, um, but we will have some interactivity today, so we're going to ask that you use the chat box and some of the links that we send you to participate with us today. So as Morgan noted, Misty and I have been teaching at uh, community college for many years, and I think back to my first semester. Um, at Pikes Peak, and I was prepping three different classes, and the end of the semester came around, and I was completely and utterly um, fearful because I believed that I had lost a bunch of papers, student papers, and I tore apart, my, tore apart my office, and then at some point I realized that actually what had happened was that the students hadn't turned in their um, their final papers, and that was... I was definitely un underprepared for that and was very surprised that students would um, would take that approach to their college uh, their college classes. Um, our plan for today then is to talk about um, we're going to talk first about um, characteristics of underprepared students and one of the the questions that we'll be addressing is that it's not always easy to define what we mean by underprepared. So we have to always keep that in mind. Um, and we also have to consider the consequences when we do label students as underprepared. So we have to think about the expectations that the students have of themselves and also the expectations that instructors have when they, when they start to realize that uh, some of their students aren't as prepared as um, we would like them to be. The other thing that we're going to address is how we can cultivate basic skills and how to help students stay engaged in psychology classes. And of course, both of these are related to helping underprepared students. And then we'll provide some um, insight into how we can help as faculty members, what we can do as individuals, and just always keeping in mind that, um, that we can use psychology principles as well to help us as we're teaching. 
<clears throat> so the first thing we want to do is we're just going to try to mimic something that we might do in our classroom, traditional classroom. And on the first day of class, we might have students um, go, uh, gather into small groups and then ask them to come up with a name for their group. And so we're going to use Google Docs and Misty's going to um, give you the link for that. Is that. Will you do that in the chat box, Misty? Or how will they get there? Yeah, Morgan's going to put it in the chat box right now. You will see that we have our webinar here. Um, Deb and I have already put our names in the box and we've already began working some of this, um, giving you an idea of what we're going to do. But the first thing we'd like for you to do is just come and find a place for your name. You'll just type in your name in the Google document. And then um, a suggestion that you have for what, what you might call this group that we're working with today. Um, uh, and again, what we're trying to do is just give you an idea of, of what, what we might do on the first day of class. So and this is that short URL code if you need that one. All right. So awesome. And what, it's really great because um, we can use these Google Docs uh, live in the classroom. So you can have your groups, um, everybody can log into the Google Doc during class and respond to a variety of different prompts that you might have. And so um, <clears throat> we can see that you can set it up ahead of time. So Sherry and Karen are in there. And then if you, know, if you had a chance, you could you know, come up with a good group name um, for us today. Anonymous Dinosaur is about to put something in. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll be going back and forth to this Google document as we go on, but just try to, to get in and get your name in there. And so one of the, the important things is that we do this the, the first day of class, if we could, um, because we want, to, um, we want to help start building relationships. Um, yeah, so the first day of class, uh, we know that from research that um, it's important that students make, make contact on, on campus, especially the, the type of colleges that, that we're teaching at where it's a completely commuter, there's no, uh, no dormitory. So we're going to help students make contact the first day of class and uh, it allows them also to um, know the second day of class maybe they don't want to sit next to a certain person. Uh, if they found that there was some something awkward going on, so it, it does it does help students the first the first day of class um, make contact. So one one of the questions that we have for you right now, and if you could type this into your chat box, we're just curious um, if you if our participants here are from two year or four year institutions, just so we can get an idea of who we have in the audience. So if you wouldn't mind in your chat box just writing. Um, what, what, whether you're a two-year or four-year college instructor. Hey, everybody. If you're writing in the chat box, um, please select send to all participants so that everyone can see it. A couple of you are sending just to the host, and only I can see it then, and I want to make sure that everyone can look at everyone's answers. Thanks. Thanks, Morgan. Yep. Okay. So the reason that, that we're interested in this um, issue is because we do know that, that research shows us that um, there's a difference in terms of preparedness for students at two four-year colleges. So according to the National Center for Public Policy and Higher Education, approximately 60% of students begin college unprepared. Um, and it's even higher for community college students. These numbers go up to as high as approximately 75% are underprepared. And what this means, though, is it's not that they're not college eligible, because clearly they've gotten into college, but it just means that they're not ready for college. So many students are required to take remedial courses, um, and that often will delay them in their progress for, towards graduation. Again, keeping in mind that this has an impact on, on their, um, their self-image and their ability to, um, to carry on through their college. So, of course, uh, students aren't ready for college, and we could spend hours discussing why that is. Why, you know, why is it that students aren't prepared to participate in college-level discussions? Why aren't students prepared for college-level reading, writing, and math? 
Um, and this is just one example of, of here we see on the slide why some students aren't ready. Um, this is a, uh, something that our colleagues at Pikes Peak use with their math students. They point out uh, that in high school, students generally get 180 days to cover a math subject, but when we get to college, we only have 30 class days. In high school, students get to do 75% of their work in class, and in college, we need to cover 75% of the material outside of class. So this is just one issue um, that, that can make it difficult for students to transition to, um, to a college preparedness. The bottom line, though, is that it doesn't matter um, why necessarily, but the real key issue is what are we going to do as instructors to, to support students. It's our obligation, whether they're prepared or not, to um, help, help them succeed in their college level classes. So one of the questions, we, again, what we'd like to ask you is, we, we know students have these deficiencies in reading, critical thinking, social skills, and time management. And so we'd like to ask you, um, what, what's the evidence that you see for this? We're assuming that, that we're all witnessing this. And so what's your evidence, and when do you first notice that, that there is some sort of deficiency? So again, we're asking that you type this in your chat box. So before the semester starts, um, Sherry, you say you see deficiencies in writing through student emails. Okay, so it, that's even, bef even before you get started. Um, that's the, a good point that you make. Anybody else? So after the first exam, um, students, have, students have definitely changed, certainly over the course of the past couple of decades. Failure to recognize the importance of citing and written assignments, also important. Um, all of these types of deficiencies can impede their progress, and it's important that we recognize them early on. And from what, what we're reading here, our, our, um, the instructors participating are seeing this right away. Students may not attend class, not realizing that matters. Um, they don't realize that um, they need to use higher level thinking, that it's not about memorization, right? So all of these things um, are evident right away. And so what we would suggest is once they're evident that we um, start to consider how we can help them because by the time it's the last, uh, last paper assignment, for example, with my students, those first semesters, it's too late for me to help them. So the sooner we can help the students um, recognize some of these deficiencies for themselves, the, the sooner we can help support them. One of the, the problems, though, is that students often lack insight in terms of their deficiencies. They often are completely surprised when they find out they're failing a course, and they, many of them cannot explain why they're struggling. There's been some research with medical students who show the these, these same lack of insight. Um, Low-achieving medical students are less likely to be able to accurately assess their weaknesses. They tend to make overly optimistic judgments about their performance. And they're often, medical students also are often surprised when they're failing a course. And we definitely see this at the community college as well. Students often don't know the information that they don't know. And they, um, they often can't judge their own competency. What we hear is that students will say, well, I work so hard. And their, their thinking is because they work so hard that they deserve an A. And so they're confusing the quantity of effort with the quality or ability that they need in, in order to succeed. Students also are really surprised by the fact that they, they, um, they graduated from college and they were competent in college, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're ready and competent to participate at the college level. So we have to help students then start to recognize their deficiencies and also be able to realize that they can make changes um, in, in terms of um, the, the kind of under preparedness that they might have. Many times students have an external locus of control. They tend to blame uh, their failures on bad luck, on professors not liking them and so forth. And what we want to try to do is help students realize 
that they can develop intellectually and academically, and that they, they do have the ability to um, succeed in, the, in their courses. Also keeping in mind, though, of course, that um, they are overwhelmed by obligations. The students that we are, um, have at our college often have full or part-time employment. They have children. Um, they are financially responsible for supporting their, their families. And so we have to help them also see that um, it might not be the right semester for them to be in college as, as they're um, struggling. And so we know that over the years, most of our colleges and universities have increased our tutoring services, we hire retention specialists, we have developmental courses, all things to assist with our underprepared students. Um, we also still see that the, we've expanded a lot of our first year experience programs or even created first year experience programs for these uh, students that are incoming that may not quite be up to college level standards. But yet we find that the statistics of success rates for at-risk students are incredibly bleak. Um, there is just, they're still struggling. As a matter of fact, um, Q et al. in 2005 reported that 75% of students who took at least one remedial reading course in college do not obtain a degree or certificate within eight years of enrollment. Um, and so uh, there's an a author named Kathleen Gabriel, and she says that basically as educators, we have an obligation to all of our students, including those who arrive under, unprepared, as members of an institution and as individual professors, we must use a myriad of actions that will provide unprepared students with real opportunities for success. If we do not, we are simply setting these students up for failure, she says, and at the same time, only pretending we have somehow fulfilled a moral obligation of providing opportunities to our diverse population in today's society. What we see is there's a model of student learning that has a chain of events that has a link between them, which is the focus of much current research and um, effort, and so we're likely to see this refined over time. One of the factors that influence learning is obviously the student characteristics, and this is going to include our individual differences, students' previous learning experiences, a current understanding of the subject, and other influences that can be grouped under uh, context characteristics. Um, this group includes the ethos of department organizing the course and the characteristics of the curriculum. They closely related to this factor is that the teacher's approach to teaching. And the effect of these factors is to influence the student's perception no, 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 no. of their context and the learning approach that's expected of them. Then we see the learning outcome is unfortunately at best a memorization of factual information and perhaps a superficial level of understanding. So what can we do? And I think that really gets down to the heart of, of why we're here, and that's we need to look at according to Gabriel, five guiding principles to really establish a solid teaching philosophy. First of all, the, we have to believe that at-risk students can become lifelong learners, and that this is really the key to the other four principles that we'll talk about. You know, it's never too late for students to change their academic habits or to discover their own abilities. The second principle is that it's imperative that students be expected to attend class, to pay attention, and to participate. So students have no idea how much time, how much time it's going to take for them to succeed when they first start their college education. Most students are going to need at least one professor who's willing to spend some time guiding them. I remember early on uh, I had a student who um, who was in my class, she was really struggling, and it took a lot of time to really teach her some of the basic time management skills, 
how, and I'm finding, and maybe many of you are as well, that this becomes more a part of the core curriculum in our psychology classes, especially those intro psych classes where we're really spending a lot of time helping the students just understand how to manage time well. How do you take notes? How do you study? And so I think that one of the things we have to consider is that, again, will you have the time, effort, and or energy to spend any amount of time to guide even just one student. The third principle, I think, is a very important principle. Uh, Friedrich Douglass said that if there is no struggle, there is no progress. And learning to struggle when things are not going smoothly is vital to success in all aspects of what we do, not just our psychology classes. And we all know that students use avoidance behaviors. They don't show up for their appointments. They miss tutoring meetings. They miss our meetings in the classroom. Um, they don't show up for workshops on ways to improve academic skills, such as note taking or test taking or even writing. And so to counter this type of behavior, what we suggest is that there needs to be some sort of policy and practice that encourages your students to encounter themselves as learners, to motivate them to become more than who they are, and to provide the resources and experiences that they need if they're going to move forward in their development. And then the fourth principle that we see here is that students have to accept responsibility for their learning progress. Students need to have goals, and they know it's a rare responsibility to uh, achieve those goals. So faculty must be careful about the words that we use when we're talking to at-risk students. Positive and encouraging words can be very enriching and inspiring. And so as faculty, we need to help facilitate these at-risk students' success by inviting them to come see us during office hours, to go over material, and or go to the tutoring and support centers. The other thing that, um, I don't want you to shoot the messenger here, but I'm going to say it anyway, is that we need to be careful about how we offer extra credit. And I would encourage you to avoid last minute deals uh, for making up missed assignments or low test scores. If students are, um, are given the opportunity to, to have a last minute deal or to earn extra credit in place of regular credit, then um, it becomes a real, well, you're reinforcing the uh, behavior that you're not necessarily wanting to see continue. I tell my students at the first of every semester that I don't offer extra credit, but I do something so out of the ordinary and so exciting. I offer 16 weeks of regular credit where they can work all semester long to do the, to earn the points that they need, and they don't have to worry about cramming at the last second to try to get extra. And I tell them extra credit's like extra money, that we all wish we had some. So, um, and then the last uh, principle that we want to look at is that students should do what they can do for themselves. So the caveat here, however, is that we shouldn't assume that the student knows what things or how to do these things that they should be doing for themselves. So just telling them to do it doesn't mean that they're capable of actually doing it. Um, and so we may have to help these students get started and even teach them how to do what they need to do for themselves so that they develop the skills to actually become self-reliant, which will ultimately enable them to get through the, um, their college career. So let me ask you guys a question here. And again, if you'll just go into the chat box. And I'd like to, for you to answer this. What are some skills that you may have to teach these underprepared or at-risk students? Right, so active reading, active note-taking. Um, how, how do you teach a student to engage in the, the reading material? I've sure heard this one. Um, so many times over the course of the years, how to take tests, exactly. So these are all very important things that we want to do. Um, during the first week of class, you obviously want to uh, identify your goals and objectives. Now, one thing that I want to say to you is you should never lower your expectations or your standards. And so your syllabi, however, should 
be provided for all students. However, for at-risk students who may not be very good note takers or listeners, having a very well-written syllabus that covers all course procedures, expectations, reading assignments, grading policies, and so on is crucial. And it's, uh, it's the best preventative measure that you can have in your classroom. And so on that first day of class, you want to really work at making sure that they understand specific expectations. Um, we're going to, we all know why our first day, our first week is so important. Um, and I think that if we had more time here today, we would use our chat box and talk a little bit about, about this. But one of the things that we want you to know is that most of us offer our syllabi in our online course management software. What the research is telling us is for these at-risk students, it is really important that they get minimally a hard copy in their hands of at least your course calendar and weekly expectations. So they are finding that it's, uh, it's absolutely invaluable for these students to have something in their hands to be able to take with them out of your classroom. Um, whether you have them read the rest of your, uh, your syllabi online is up to you, but the, the research is showing us that we really should have something in our hands uh, for these at-risk students to give to them on that first day. Um, additionally, Giving a syllabi quiz we're seeing is a, a really useful tool for these students and how you do that is up to you. We've seen some really creative ways that people have incorporated syllabi quiz to really help get that information to the students. The other thing that we need to do is to promote our class attendance. Um, learn the students' names. However you need to do that, um, we use nameplates. You have a name game, do one minute interviews, take photos, have whatever helps you, really learn their names, and then have the students learn each other's names. So using that Google document, uh, like we showed you early on, is one of the ways that we have um, used that to get an icebreaker going for the students to really have uh, interaction and to learn who, who they are uh, right from the get-go. Um, be sure that you keep a respectful class atmosphere, obviously having a positive attitude and, and enthusiasm for your subject. Um, act, interactive activities, more than just the PowerPoints, unfortunately, like we're doing with you today. Um, and then really take time to uh, show the students what it means to have a readiness to learn. So, for example, learning is not a spectator sport, and really helping them understand that the responsibility to learn belongs to them, and it's, it's really up to them, and for learning to happen in any course, that they have to be active in that process. And then you might say something like, for our class, you're expected to come to class prepared. You're expected to, to read the material, to study the material, and to, to get the assigned reading done before you're here at my class, in my classroom. So being prepared, and really going over this in some detail with the students to say that being prepared for class really helps them to uh, be more active in the classroom, but it also helps you to construct a knowledge base where their learning kind of rests. The other thing that you want to do is to dialogue with your students and build those relationships. This is uh, Deb again. So one of the things that I do with students, um, I've done in the past, even with online students, is I have them uh, meet with me during the first part of the semester. Of course, we're at a community college with small classes, so this doesn't necessarily work for larger classrooms. But um, I do have, sometimes the online students, I'll have them call. We'll have a phone meeting to just introduce ourselves. The other thing I do is I, on the first day, I give a handout that just basically is a who am I. And they just give me some background information on um, details of, of um, their major and so forth. Um, we can also, we've, we've seen our colleagues use weekly calendars. Um, this is an example. And one of our math colleagues uses this to um, have the students dialogue with each other and they talk about time management, they talk about the different um, tasks that they have during the week, and they hold each other accountable. So they might do this on the beginning of one week and then the following week they'll look at each other's calendars and see how they've done. So one of the things that we want to talk to the student about is, you know, how are you going to overcome the obstacles 
that are going to happen inevitably this semester. How are you going to manage your emotions? How are you going to deal with your competing priorities and procrastination? Um, one of the things that we actually do, uh, this is uh, from a couple of our math colleagues at the college, they sit down with the students and they ask them, how are you going to study every day? Are you going to do this in a, in a group or with a friend? Are you going to do it on your own? Where are you going to do it? So they take this information. They actually devote some class time to talking with these students about this. The other thing is talking about how much time they're actually going to invest. Again, we like what the, the math colleagues do here at Pikes Peak. They tell their students, if you want to earn a C, you're going to need to spend at least 10 hours outside of class each week. If you want to earn a B, you need at least 16 hours. If you're going to earn an A, that's going to be minimally 20 hours outside of class each week. Now, I want to show you this is a uh, performance prognosis inventory that, again, we've included in the, uh, um, the PowerPoint here. But you can see this is from an analytical chemistry course. And the instructor here basically gives an inventory that the students have to answer true or false to. Things like, I will always read the lecture material before I go to lecture, true or false. They just say, true, they're going to do it, or false. They go through and they answer these questions. And it says, the last one, I know that I can make an A in this class and will put forth the effort to do so. And then what I love about this inventory is that she provides the predicted grade for their performance for the semester. So if they had 10 to 13 true responses, their predicted grade is an A. And you can see there, if they've answered less than two, their predicted grade is an F. But one of the most powerful things about this form is that she mentions that you can change your predicted grade at any point by changing your behavior such that more of the statements are true. And then she reminds them that they have free tutoring services at the university. So what we'd like for you to do is if you would go back to our Google document where you've typed your name, you can see that there's a performance progress inventory. We'd like for you to type in two questions there in the Google document. You can see that Deb and I have already put one in there. I will always read the assigned chapter prior to coming to class. I will meet with my instructor if my exam grade is lower than a C. So um, go ahead and if you don't mind typing in a couple of questions, what this will do for you is you can go through and read the questions and create your own performance progress inventory uh, that you can have even after this webinar is over. And uh, um, I've created one for my class. Uh, we're testing it out this semester to see how the students are, are performing. They did, a, they did it at the beginning of the semester. They took a midterm inventory, and then they will uh, take it again at the end of the semester to see how their behavior aligned with their predicted grade. And so we'll, we'll leave that up for you to continue to work on as we go throughout the, 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 uh, uh, the talk here today. Let's go back to this. All right. So the other information that we want to remind you about is making the material relevant, really making sure that you're incorporating examples and writing assignments that's going to increase their engagement. And I think that's one of the importance of the who am I questions that Deb uses is that she gets in the sense right away from the um, from the students what their career interests are. And that way that gives us the opportunity to really put examples into our lectures, into our classroom activities that engage the students so that they can see that the material that they are covering is actually uh, relevant to what they're, what, why we're studying the, the topic. Um, again, as much as possible, move away by desk, by PowerPoint. Try to do more skills-based instruction. Consider learning communities if you've never tried that. And then when it's applicable, flip your classroom. Those are a lot of fun. To, to do. Um, and then also let's remember that we can recognize the students' strengths and weaknesses and that students may not necessarily know how to do the studying and the reading and to manage their course assignments and to really making sure that they know what the resources at the college or university where you're at, what those are and how to get access to them and then helping them build their study skills. And, of course, being psychologists, we should consider using psychological principles uh, in the classroom, positive reinforcement. Uh, I am teaching an 830 class this semester, and I'm having a really difficult time getting students to show up 
um, on time, and so we have been trying to use positive reinforcement with them helping to decide on the reinforcers. Um, role models, of course, are important important and um, considering how we can build different programs to modify their behavior and ours if necessary. So we are now coming to the end of, of this webinar and just to conclude, um, you know, it is important to recognize students who need support. We, at the beginning, um, we were talking about how, how we know it, that students um, are having troubles and we often know right away. Um, we should try to stay engaged, help our students stay engaged, know the resources, and share these resources with, um, with our colleagues to help them. And one of the things is to recognize, when you do recognize that remediation is needed, we need to get those resources quickly. So if you only assess uh, once during the semester with a, a midterm, um, or a final that might be too late for some of these students who are struggling. Or if you only require one term paper and it's due at the end of the semester, you may not actually know that they need help. So trying to find a way to have assessments earlier in the semester so that you can get these students to the appropriate uh, support right away. So we will just end with this quote. And I guess, Morgan, if you want to open up for um, questions that the participants might have for us. I'm going to take the ball back really fast. Okay. Well, thank you both so much for that great presentation. Um, we do have a couple of questions. Let me pull them up really fast. Again, if anyone wants to ask any questions, please chat them to me. Okay. So question number one, do you ever use the performance prognosis as a means for rewards such as extra credit? Um, well, as, as Misty was saying earlier, that we, we try to avoid extra credit as much as possible. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know that I would use it as extra credit, but certainly it's good for students to be able to see that they are in control of changing their behavior. And so we want to use the, that prognosis early enough in the semester that they can make changes to their behavior. And then we have one more question. Um, what are your favorite skills-based presentations or projects? You know, we try to use really practical um, activities for the students. One of the things that, that, and they don't have to be hard. So one of the things that we worked on right away, you know, when I just did a, an activity with the students in the classroom where I had them uh, doing coloring pages, and then they came up with a, a sales, uh, a sales uh, advertisement campaign based upon Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, and so they chose their product and they came up with a campaign and, and they presented it. So just trying to get some fun into the classroom, um, getting it so that they are excited about coming to class and then making sure that these activities, you know, they, they are quick, they're easy to do, and they can be done in groups. And then we also have some, you know, just the, the short videos, um, things to really just engage them uh, right away. And we do have a comment from Alan Ernst. He says, it seems to us that students' worldview and strategies are driven by financial aid guidelines. Can you speak to that at all? Could you repeat the first part? I'm sorry, sure, sorry. It seems to us that students' worldview and their strategies are driven by financial aid guidelines. Um, I guess I would need more clarification from Alan. I'm, I'm not sure, like, I'm not sure how to address that. I think he's trying to focus more on, um, you're talking about community colleges and that your, like, the strategies um, are driven by what students, like, specific financial, like, how do you work with students um, who maybe have, like, a little bit more uh, financial aid issues? Right, right. Yeah, so a lot of their stuff happens because uh, of just they can't afford to buy the textbook or they can't afford to gain access to their course management software provided through a, through the, the publisher, kind of like that, I'm assuming is what you mean? Yes. Yeah, it, so, you know, I think working with the, the college to have, um, to have resources available to those students, you know, we know that there's going to be a handful who are going to struggle, and so, um, most of the publishers have been really helpful about providing, you know, limited access until their their until their uh, financial aid comes through. Mm -hmm. um, we also at our institution make sure that we keep extra copies of the textbook in the library. 
Um, I keep extra copies of the textbook in my office. Um, I've even been known to, to check them out to students and, um, you know, talk about the importance of, I worked with the uh, uh, Dean of Students to, to make sure that, you know, if it wasn't returned, that there would be a student code of conduct violation. And so they see that it's very important to return those books. So really just trying to strategize about the different solutions that we can provide, at least to get the materials right away so that they can be successful, so that, that financial aid isn't the cause of them starting off the semester behind. I hope that answers your question. Right, yes. He gave another comment saying that one example is that they seem to focus on getting their stipend and do the minimum to stay in the system. So I definitely think you touched upon that. Okay, well, thank you again so much, everyone, for joining, and thank you for being patient while we dealt with the technical difficulty. We will be putting this recording and the PowerPoint on the community page at this link over here. You can find out more about the community page by going to this link. We have the whole psychology community dedicated to our past webinars that are up, um, blog content, discussions, so feel free to check that out and join. And again, thanks so much to Deb and Misty. It was a pleasure to have you, and thanks to everyone for joining. Have a great day. Thank, thank you, you all. Everybody.